Welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I thought I'd be healthier and better shape, feel better both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and be further along in my life? If so, come on this journey with my dad as he explores all things health and wellness from a holistic, medical perspective, even as a classically trained physician. He'll share integrative strategies to optimize health and inspire you to join the modern medicine movement. Welcome, 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 welcome everyone to the modern medicine movement and a big aloha. Thomas Hemingway here and I'm super excited, super grateful to be here with you. Just wanted to thank you. Thank you to everyone whom are listening and taking time out for yourselves and your health because this podcast is truly for you to help you achieve optimal health, total and complete health of your mind, your body, your spirit, your emotions, your relationships, truly everything health. And I'm right here on this journey with you and I strive to add value to you and your loved ones. So just keep the feedback coming. I'm here to serve you And in fact, this episode comes as a result of feedback and questions that you've asked me, and it really excites me to share it with you for that reason and for the fact that this topic and getting to know it intimately and enhancing it in myself and my family has literally changed our health and our lives. And so, oh, I just, I'm passionate about this subject. It's just super interesting, super exciting. You might be asking yourself, well, what is it? What, what is this topic that changed your life? Well, it's none other than that of our microbiome and our microbiome, which is both so very personal, it's so unique, but yet integral to our health. You might say, well, what is that? What is that microbiome? Why should I even care about it? Well, <laughs> you should for a bunch of reasons. Not only is it part of you and truly an intimate part of you, but it actually makes you the individual that you are and can contribute in large part to your overall health and wellness. So let's get into it. Why should we even care? Well, as I mentioned, it's part of us and the organisms that make up this microbiome, the bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, everything that lives on us and within us actually outnumber us by at least... 10 to 1, maybe even more than that, depending on what you read. We, mere humans, are actually outnumbered. (laughs) Our cells are truly outnumbered by our microbiome. In fact, our microbiome consists of trillions of cells. And although the majority live in our gut, and we're going to talk a lot about that here in a little bit, you know, how this relates to our so-called gut health because they're predominantly located in our intestinal tract, but they also live on our skin, in our nose, in our mouth, and we just can't live without them. And they play an integral part in our overall health and especially in our gut health. And interestingly enough, you know, we often hear about, you know, our human genome, um, you know, the human genome project, which basically has mapped out the approximately 25,000 human genes. Well, in comparison, there was another project called the microbiome, you know, the human microbiome project, which is also trying to map out the human microbiome, which has way more genetic information. In fact, there's somewhat in the neighborhood of 46 million genes in our microbiome. And like I said, there's only about 25,000 human genes. So the genetic material in and of itself also far outnumbers our human DNA by, you know, over a hundred to one. Um, this microbiome, sometimes you guys uh, have heard this uh, comment made, you know, as our gut being our second brain. Well, that's for a variety of reasons. One, the actual weight of all these, you know, trillions of microorganisms weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe four or five pounds, which is about the weight of our human brain. And, you know, not only this, but as we'll learn later on in this podcast of how 
the gut can actually, through the bacteria there, can send chemical signals and messengers and hormones and actually communicate with our brain. And, you know, that's another reason why it's referred to as this second brain. It's just super exciting. Oh, my gosh, I can't even wait to share with you. So let's, you know, kind of get back into, you know, where this all begins. And, well, um, the cool thing about this is that everything starts, you know, at birth, actually maybe even a little bit before birth, but but this microbiome that, that we have is something that it's not just something we're born with, like our actual DNA, but it's something that we develop. It's something that changes. It's super interesting because our DNA, frankly, you know, could be considered a little bit boring because all it is is a genetic sequence that codes for certain proteins. And we just get it, right? Part of our dad, part of our mom, and it's just there. And we can't really manipulate our actual DNA that much, um, but our, you know, microbiome, if you will, is, is I think at least, if not more interesting in the fact that we can affect changes in actually pretty easily, which is not actually so simple with our own DNA. And in fact, our microbiome actually tells a story. It actually tells not only, you know, about the sequencing of these genes and what those genes code for and, and translate into proteins, you know, it actually tells a whole story. It tells about where we came from, whether we were born through a typical vaginal birth or whether we were born via C-section. Um, by studying our microbiome, we can determine this. We can determine where we've lived, have we've lived in a real industrialized and urban setting or have we lived in a real rural setting have we you know been able to you know achieve a pretty diverse diet you know or have we been on certain medications which have you know made marks in our you know uh, microbiome's history if you will too many courses of antibiotics what have you this this can actually be seen and discovered through looking at our DNA of our microbiome and looking at the makeup and what constitutes our microbiome. So it's actually super exciting. It tells us a whole story, not just a simple sequencing of what these genes code for, you know, protein wise. So I, I think it's just fascinating. Um, so, you know, a little bit about what this does for us, our microbiome, you know, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Well, you know, it could be either, to be honest. It sort of depends on how we care for it. You know, the bacteria in our microbiome, which I'll talk about mostly because that's sort of what outnumbers the other things that are there, like the viruses, the fungi, and the protozoa. And, and uh, so we'll talk a lot about the bacteria, but they can help us by digesting our food. They can regulate and communicate with our own immune system. You know, they can help our immune health or it could be harmed if we don't take care of it in other ways. It could also protect us against certain bacteria, you know, that cause disease by keeping them in check, if you will, and keeping them in balance. Also, these bacteria can produce for us vitamins that we don't easily make for ourselves. It can produce a lot of the different B vitamins, you know, B12, B2, which is riboflavin, B6, pyridoxine, even thiamine, which is B1, and then also some fat-soluble vitamins like Vitamin K, for example, which is excellent for our need for clotting, you know, our blood clotting, among other things. Also, as mentioned briefly, this, uh, this communication that exists through the gut, you know, with these bacteria sending these chemical and other hormones, um, they can communicate with the brain. You know, this is referred to as the enteric nervous system. So all these things and more the microbiome and especially our gut health um, can do for us. But let's back it up a little bit. Where did all this come from? How long have we known about this? Um, this is actually super interesting. I think it sets the scene and the tone for, for where all this comes from. So, you know, this, this microbiome, if you will, and gut health was in general sort of mainstream medicine wasn't really recognized very much in our current medical environment until maybe the late you know, 1990s. And this has personally been demonstrated in my life because I went to medical school in the 90s and we didn't really talk about it, you know, and 
and it was just kind of in the up and coming uh, phase. And now, you know, over 20 some odd years later, it's becoming finally recognized and its importance and so on. But truthfully, the roots of it was first discovered way back when, several hundred years ago in the 1600s, when Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, for the first time, you know, was actually able to see with the microscope these organisms. And so with him being able to first be able to see them, and then with, you know, those that followed him later, like Louis Pasteur, which most of us have heard about, you know, who characterized this, uh, this uh, theory that, that, you know, these microorganisms could actually cause disease, you know, and actually what's super interesting is, you know, he invented the pasteurization process, right? The, the quick flash heating of, you know, actually what he was more interested about initially was alcoholic beverages, like, like wine, for example, beer and so on. He wanted to you know, be able to prevent them from spoiling, if you will. And so he found out that through the heating, he was able to kill this bacteria to prevent the spoilage of alcohol, you know, wine and beer. You know, he actually called it fighting the diseases of wine. <laughs> and later this was applied, you know, to other liquids like milk. And, and you know, it's super, it's super interesting because what originated in fighting, you know, the disease of wine, if you will, actually led Pasteur to the idea that these microorganisms could also infect us, you know, humans and other animals, and they could and even plants for that matter, and they could cause disease. And he proposed, you know, this sort of theory of microorganisms, you know, adversely affecting the human body, which we often refer to as the germ theory of disease. And he was, you know, able to actually identify that in, you know, in conjunction with the microorganisms. The germ theory in and of itself has been around since, you know, Greek times when even before Christ, when they knew that, that there were certain diseases out there, but they didn't know what caused them. And then in, you know, the 1600s with uh, Leeuwenhoff, when he saw them, and then 1800s when Pasteur was able to identify this process, it sort of lay, laid the groundwork for this germ theory, which has really been kind of the main theory in science with respect to microorganisms in general. You know, this later led to Joseph Lister, who, you know, developed the antiseptic methods in surgery, for example, where he found that, hey, it really does matter, you know, if you wash your hands prior to a surgery. Like, they didn't know, you know, and they, and they didn't know for a couple of reasons. They didn't know that microorganisms like bacteria and so on existed, and then when they found out they did, they started paying attention, but this was all primarily in relationship to this germ theory of disease and, and they were tended to, you know, be looked at always as sort of an adverse thing or a bad thing. And the beneficial, you know, effects of our microbiome, for example, wasn't really recognized until relatively recent, recently, like I said, in the late 90s, which super exciting. And so, you know, that initial theory, the germ theory, um, has sort of been the one that's been commonplace over the years. And now there's other thoughts, even one, you know, referred to as the hygiene theory, which, you know, is super interesting in and of itself, because it actually looks at, you know, our environments in which we were raised, you know, for example, um, there are a lot of disease processes, chronic autoimmune type, inflammatory type of disorders that are way more present or higher incidence of them in industrialized societies, you know, places like in the U.S. where, you know, we, among other industrialized nations for years, have been doing things like chlorinating our water. Um, you know, in our fields, we're using, unfortunately, far more commonly, you know, things like glyphosate, which is Roundup. And, you know, we're using too many courses of antibiotics, you know, both you know, to treat illnesses that probably don't need them, like an upper respiratory infection or a sinusitis that are predominantly caused by bacteria, or even we're eating them inadvertently, which we're not thinking about because there's antibiotics which have been used, you know, in raising the cows that are producing our milk, and, and those antibiotics, you know, fatten them up basically, and they can produce more milk, and then we get the downstream effects of that. So what they've seen is that in industrialized countries where, you know, we're using more antibiotics and more methods to quote unquote improve our hygiene, it's actually worsening 
our microbiome. It's limiting the diversity and it does have a downstream effect. And so, you know, there is a significant amount of evidence now supporting this idea that the, you know, decreased exposure, if you will, to these microorganisms because of this, you know, hygiene issue that we talked about using all these antibiotics, chlorinating our water, using glyphosate and other um, pesticides and so on has actually limited the diversity of our microbiome. And with that limited diversity, it's actually increased the incidence of chronic diseases such as asthma, such as inflammatory bowel disease, which is like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, also things like IBS. And so it's super interesting because this has actually been shown in various uh, studies looking at different populations of people and the incidence of these chronic illnesses. You know, if you take, for example, somebody in the developing world, say in the Amazon or something that has a super diverse microbiome, in other words, the colonies are all very different and they're in sort of a a very even number, if you will. So there's no one colony that's taking over and, and governing, you know, how the body reacts to certain things. It's a nice diverse sample of bacteria. These people with the most diverse microbiome, if you will, have actually been shown to have very, very few cases of these chronic illnesses like you know, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, asthma, even diabetes and things like that, that that are super common in our society. They're actually not that common in, in these other, you know, less industrialized areas where their microbiome is much more diverse. So super interesting. Not only is our, you know, financial portfolio, right, uh, supposed to be diverse and I hate to even talk about that right now because of what's going on in the world, but it's it's super important also to diversify our own microbiome, and we'll, we'll talk about how we can do that uh, throughout the course of this podcast and and others. So, you know what you know where where does this begin in us? So how how does this diversification occur? What can we do to improve it, and what limits it? Well, it all starts early, early on, early on you know, at birth, or it can even happen before birth, you know, with the introduction of antibiotics during pregnancy or antibiotics in the first year of life. Uh, The more exposure, you know, to antibiotics early on, it's been linked, you know, to increase incidence of asthma, for example, other allergic diseases. Also, it tends to be more common in births that were by cesarean, which is, you know, you could sort of suspect that because not only do a lot of cesarean, you know, births end up getting antibiotics. You know, typically most surgeries at the cut time, they give a dose of antibiotics uh, right at that. Um, often they follow up with additional doses, especially if the mom gets a fever or anything. So often these, these babies that are born by cesarean are exposed to antibiotics early on, and they've actually been shown to have a higher incidence of, of asthma and other chronic illnesses. And so One of the things that limits, you know, this diversity of our gut microbiome is antibiotics. That's been shown very commonly. It's been shown in many cases. It's pretty well known and understood. And so, you know, I think one of the original studies was was looking at asthma in particular and other allergic diseases. And it looked at groups of kids from uh, Sweden and Estonia. And what they found is that those that had received antibiotics had much decreased you know, biodiversity of this uh, gut flora or intestinal flora, and they tended to, you know, get these allergies more commonly. And those that had a very diverse, you know, gut bacterial profile were less likely to get these common allergic illnesses like asthma and, and skin conditions like eczema and acne and all these things, as well as this has been shown in the bowel diseases, uh, referred to as inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and so on. So, so while we're talking about birth, um, you know, we might as well talk about sort of the difference between, you know, a vaginal birth and a cesarean birth. And, and we can even talk about some of this uh, interplay between the gut uh, hormones and so on in the pregnant mom. This is just super interesting stuff. So let's just give you an example. So So during pregnancy, in the mom's vagina, she has cells um, 
that, uh, like lactobacillus, for example, they ramp up the, the production of a um, sugar called glycogen. Okay, And this glycogen is actually not for the mom, but it's actually for the lactobacillus bacteria that lives in her gut. And that bacteria converts the sugar lactose to lactic acid, which decreases the pH, which is advantageous because it repels, you know, having a lower or more acidic pH during pregnancy actually repels the bad bacteria, um, which helps to protect, you know, the growing pregnancy and fetus. And also, you know, another interesting thing is the lactobacillus affects the breast milk uh, production via a signaling process from them, from the gut bacteria itself, actually increasing the breast milk production, which is not a separate, you know, isolated hormonal thing from mom, but it's actually the gut bacteria through this hormonal signaling process. And it's been shown by taking, for example, the gut flora, you know, doing a fecal transplant. Ugh, I know it sounds gross, but taking that, that gut flora from the mom, from a pregnant woman, and you can put that, you know, late trimester woman's uh, fecal transplant into a mouse that doesn't have any hormonal changes consistent with pregnancy or lactation. You can put that gut flora in a non-pregnant mouse, and it'll actually start to exhibit increased uh, breast milk production and all the same things that the mother is doing in late term pregnancy and this mouse is not even pregnant so super interesting this is all coming from the signaling from the gut and i'll share with you a few other examples which are equally fascinating in which the gut flora or a microbiome can actually affect us through hormonal and other signaling processes so continuing on at birth you know we know that as the baby is born and delivered vaginally the baby's head turns actually faces the mom's, you know, bud and then the vagina and gets exposed to the mother's normal flora, okay? Like her lactobacillus, for example, which lives there, which is a really, really good thing because we'd rather have the baby be colonized with lactobacillus than colonized with bad, you know, hospital bacteria like staph, for example, which is tends to be more common in C-section babies because they don't get to pass through the birth canal and pick up these good bacteria from the mom. And so they miss out on that. So one of the things we might consider doing, and, and some actually are doing this now, is in C-section babies, they're actually wiping the C-section babies down with the fluid from the mother's vagina so they can actually give the baby some of this good flora and expose them to it because they miss out on the opportunity as they pass through the vaginal canal or as they don't pass through the vaginal canal through a cesarean birth. But traditionally, we've done the opposite of this, right? You know, as soon as a baby's born, what do we do? We just wipe them all down. And sometimes we wipe them down with harsh antiseptic soaps. And thank goodness, this is sort of trending. We are trending away from this and kind of understanding that it's not necessarily a good thing to take a brand new newborn baby with all these good bacteria from the mom and then just, you know, wipe them down completely and get rid of it. So we're actually, we're starting to, you know, appreciate the good uh, microbiome effects of the mother here. And so I just find this fascinating, fascinating. Isn't this cool? You guys liking this? So continuing on, you know, not only um, upon birth, but upon breastfeeding, you know, here's another example. I think is so cool. The mom actually, uh, the breastfeeding in and of itself in the milk, you have these things called human milk oligosaccharides or, or so-called HMOs. And so it's part of the breast milk, but it's actually non-nutritive for the baby. The baby can't even use it. But interestingly enough, the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, hopefully that the baby got from the mom in the baby's gut now actually breaks down these HMOs, which the baby can't break down itself, these human milk oligosaccharides, and uses them for food and can thereby you know, increase its own fitness and, and survive, reproduce, and make more of these good bacteria like the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus and they also break down, for example, lactose, okay? And so gut bacteria like the lactobacillus bifidobacterium that can break down lactose actually, you know, help, say, with somebody who may be lactose intolerant, for example. It's not really a quote-unquote allergy, but it's something that can be treated with improving the diversity of one's gut health and microbiome. If you have the right bacteria there, like the lactobacillus, you can actually break down 
the lactose and not have all the bloating and other issues that come. So it's super interesting stuff. And this actually serves as a food, you know, for these bacteria like the lactobacillus. And, and it can further help us then, you know, by, by breaking down the lactose. So super cool. I, I just think what an awesome example of symbiosis is so cool. So anyway, continuing on, you know, not only is the breast milk, you know, composed of these HMOs, which feed our good gut bacteria, but of course, also composed of lots of good immunologic you know, things that help us, you know, immunoglobulins that help us and protect the baby against disease and things. I mean, that breast milk is literally, as they say, you know, liquid gold, you know, for us, for the babies, but also for the good gut bacteria that it's also feeding, as mentioned. So super important if, you know, any women out there are are having babies or will or, or can, you know, breastfeed, super highly encourage it if at all possible, because, you know, if you, if you feed the baby formula, for example, you're missing out on this huge benefit of this, you know, increase in the good gut bacteria of the baby. And when you have, as I mentioned before, a lower incidence of the diversity or the mixed good bacteria in the, in the gut or the intestinal tract, these babies like, like, uh, those mentioned before, but also formula fed babies, interesting enough, tend to also have an increased risk of asthma, risk of allergies, autoimmune diseases due to not the genes, not, not our own DNA, but actually due to poor gut health and poor diversity. So another win for breastfeeding. But anyway, let's move right along. I don't get, get, get uh, to down that track and bore you, but as the baby, you know, ages and, you know, we all know little kids love to put things in their mouth which, you know, sometimes we as parents are just like, ah, why do they do this? And they go outside and they play in the dirt and they get it all over their bodies. Well, actually, that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing that they're exposing themselves to all different bacteria and organisms outside as they play in the dirt and, and experiencing the world because we know they do so, right, by putting everything in their mouths. And by so doing, this also diversifies more their microbiome, and it starts early in life, you know, with exposure to good microbes in this fashion. So super interesting, you know, as babies, they may have only 100 or so species um, of different bacteria, and then you get um, well over 1,000 different species as you, as you grow up and get into adulthood, and this is actually super helpful for your body because what has also been seen is that as we age, the elderly person tends to have decreased uh, diversity in the gut microbiome. And that's due to a lot of different factors. Diet is a big part of it. And, and as the gut microbiome diversity decreases, that's also shown to decrease the immune function. And so, as we mentioned earlier, you know, having a too far industrialized society that's super worried about, you know, um, um, limiting exposure to microbes in early life, not letting our kids play outside in the dirt or letting them, you know, have way too many courses of antibiotics over their childhood for things that often don't need antibiotics, like a common cold or an ear infection most commonly or a throat infection most commonly. Most of these don't need antibiotics. But in this practice, in the industrialized nations like the U.S., we tend to limit and reduce the diversity of our own microbial flora and and this actually really messes with our gut health and makes us more prone to disease. And so, you know, in the, in the worst cases, like many of you have probably heard of a case called Clostridium difficile colitis or C. diff colitis. This is basically because the intestinal flora or the gut health of an individual has been significantly changed by a course of antibiotics. And that antibiotics kills a lot of the good um, bacteria. And then those that are in smaller populations that aren't affected by this antibiotic can proliferate and predominate. And they can cause this super nasty, gross C. diff colitis infection that can be, you know, really bad. It can even be life threatening, you know? And so it's, it's one of these things that has lots of, you know, downstream effects. You know, often we don't really think about, you know, antibiotic use in kids. Oh, they have an ear infection. They must need an antibiotic. Well, actually most of the time they don't. And, and if we give them or us antibiotics unnecessarily, we can 
significantly adversely affect the diversity of our microbiome. And so not only is this interesting, I find it fascinating, but it's super important for our health. So we should pay more attention. There's also other, you know, medications that can really mess up our gut health. And I don't have time to talk about all of them in this podcast, but they include things like the NSAIDs, you know, things like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, you know, and they uh, mess up our gut as well as things like um, acid reducing agents. You know, I mean, the pH in the stomach is supposed to be low for a reason, right? It's supposed to repel bacteria. And, and when we raise the pH by antacids, then we are allowing, you know, some of these not so great bacteria to proliferate and to affect us in an adverse way. So they can be pathologic. And so this sort of, I've been talking about this for a little while now, but this ratio, if you will, of the good bacteria to the bad bacteria in our intestines is, can really get out of whack, you know, can get out of balance, out of alignment. And this imbalance is often referred to as dysbiosis. So I know it sounds like kind of a weird you know, complicated word, but it just means an imbalance of our gut microbes, if you will. And this dysbiosis, this imbalance can actually be the root cause of a lot of the symptoms and illnesses that we face as humans. Things um, as commonplace as feeling bloated, things like weight gain, yeast overgrowth, food cravings, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, celiac, gluten sensitivity, uh, food allergies, chronic fatigue syndrome, a lot of skin conditions like acne, rosacea, eczema, and also um, mental health conditions like depression. A lot of these can find roots in an imbalance in our gut, this dysbiosis, if you will. So yes, 100% our diet does matter. Yes, it does, because not only are we feeding ourselves, but we're feeding our gut, our gut bacteria, our microbiome. And what we feed it really will make a difference as to whether we develop this dysbiosis and its associated problems or not. So really got to pay attention to this stuff. It's so, so important. Um, because our gut bacteria can either harm us or they can help us. And I like to think that predominantly they're going to help us and hopefully help us significantly because we take good care of them because they can help us in so many ways, right? We talked about this a little bit. They can help us digest food that we might not be able to digest. They can help us maintain the integrity of our gut lining to keep our gap junctions between the cells tight, you know, so we don't have leakage or this thing that's often referred to as a leaky gut. You know, they can also help us crowd out the harmful bacteria. Like we just talked about in the case of C. diff colitis, they can help with lots of other immune uh, function by helping bring cells to our immune system. You know, we have a huge blood flow that goes through our gut and, and is able to recognize these immune cells and send signaling to our helper cells and our T cells, for example. There's a huge part of that going on in the gut, this enteric blood flow um, that bathes the gut, helps promote and circulate these messengers for our immune system. They also can help us by producing the vitamins, as I mentioned before, also enzymes, and also hormones and the signaling that we've talked about because, you know, this is how we can simply you know, affect, you know, our mental health, right? One of the ways is that we, if we grow a good gut garden, a good gut bacteria, if you will, you know, as we know, most of the serotonin, the majority of it is actually produced in our gut, the majority. And also the other happy hormones like dopamine are produced in in large percentages. So uh, it's super interesting, super exciting. Our gut does so much for us. And it's, it's so hard for me to believe that 20 years ago, this wasn't even recognized, you know? And another thing that it does is it can help us, our gut microbes, our mi- microbacteria and organisms can, can help us through gene regulation. This is where it gets, I think, super interesting. So many of you might have heard of what's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is simply the study of changes in organisms like us and humans through the modification of gene expression. So this just means turning 
the production on or off of certain proteins or enzymes, for example, rather than affecting change by changing the genetic code itself. So as mentioned in the beginning, you know, these gut bacteria have much more DNA than we do. But they, through what they can do, they can make hormones, they can modify receptors, they can do all these things which can affect whether or not we as humans turn on certain genes. This is called epigenetics. So we're not changing our DNA, but we are modulating it through our gut bacteria. It's super interesting. I mean, take the case, for example, of the identical twins, and one is obese and one is thin, and yet they got the same DNA. Identical twins share the same exact genetic makeup, yet why is one overweight and one thin? Well, what they found is that the secret to this mystery is in the gut. It's in their gut floor, the microbiome um, there. You know, if you take the gut flora, you do like a fecal transplant, for example, from the obese, you know, twin, and you put it in a normal mouse, and guess what? That normal, not obese mouse gets obese from the gut bacteria that were transplanted from the obese twin. Take the other case, for example. Take the thin twin, and you put the fecal transplant of its microbiome from its gut into another mouse. You feed these two mice, which started out and, and are and continue to be genetically identical. You put the microbiome of one through the gut or fecal transplant, the obese um, twin gives that to the one. The second one gets the fecal transplant of the thin one. And although they're identical genetically, these mice, and they're actually, this is even more interesting. Get this, they're actually fed the same exact diet. And guess what happens? These two mice that started out the same weight and identical, the one that got the fecal transplant from the obese twin, gets obese and gains more weight. And then the one from the thin twin does not. And they have exactly the same diet. Holy cow, isn't this fascinating? I think this is fascinating. And this is through the epigenetics. So maybe in a later podcast, we can talk more about this because this is just so incredibly interesting how we can modulate these bacteria that live within us so that they help us be a thin mouse, right? Because sometimes people just can't lose that, you know, additional 10 pounds. It's so stubborn and they change, you know, the amount of calories they're eating and, and so on and so forth. But if you have the wrong mix, the wrong gut bacteria, you're going to hold on to the calories and you're going to be so efficient at taking them in that you'll still be overweight, even though you've changed the number of calories you're consuming. It's not what I learned in medical school. In medical school, I learned calories in as calories out. And, you know, it was that straight, simple, and dry. And, and that's, not it. that's not the whole picture. It's really not. These gut bacteria can actually influence that. And we, we can change that. So this dysbiosis or this imbalance, like I mentioned, that occurs within our gut is super common at least one in five Americans, if not more. I would say probably half of Americans suffer from some form of dysbiosis. And this leads to, you know, all these symptoms that we talked about before, everything from bloating and, and sort of the brain fog or fatigue, stomach upset, lots of these skin conditions like I talked about, um, can be, you know, traced directly back to the gut and to the imbalance of the gut. You know, some of you... Uh, <laughs> Like I said, you know, sometimes it could be said that, you know, these cravings that we have, you know, it's, it's not just your, your lack of self-control. You know, maybe your organisms right there in your gut, your microbiome, they made you do it. You know, they might have caused these cra cravings. And there's a super interesting article. I, I just don't have time to get all, all into it uh, today, but I'll put it in the show notes. And it's, it's entitled, Is Eating Behavior manipulated by the gastrointestinal microbiota. Evolutionary pressures and potential mechanisms. This was published uh, in bioassays by the authors Alcock, Maley, and Octopus, and it's fascinating. If you even have a slightly nerdy, you know, scientific uh, uh, interest, I would definitely recommend reading it. It's super, super interesting, and it just talks about how the gut bacteria can actually influence our cravings. 
they can actually influence our cravings because for them, these bacteria, truly, it's a matter of life or death, right? They want the foods that help them survive and, and reproduce at all costs. And they may be the not so great bacteria that want to eat lots of sugars, lots of simple sugars. And so they actually influence our choices by sending us signals and cravings for those types of food. But if we can adjust that, which it's been shown absolutely 100%, we can. And I've seen this in my own life and in my family's life as we've altered our diet and added supplements and probiotics and got our balance you know, back so we don't have dysbiosis, so we have a great diversity, that our cravings change. So I've seen it in my own life. I can read it here in the literature. And there's lots of pathways by which they can do this, both, you know, through these cravings, you know, they can affect satiety pathways. It's just super, super interesting. And so these bacteria that live with us, in us, and among us, and in our gut, they're smart. They can do a lot of things, you know. They can influence our habits. They can influence our food choices. They can influence our cravings. Heck, they can even change receptor expression. You know, this goes back to the epigenetics thing that we were talking about. You know, they can also, you know, like I mentioned, this experiment that was done in the obese and and thin twin when their gut bacteria was transplanted to the mice, we can do that with other um, um, backgrounds. Like, for example, let's say we have someone who has a great composition and diversity of gut bacteria like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium longum, which, which actually have been shown to produce some of these chemical messengers to alleviate stress and to, you know, um, modify and decrease anxiety and, and increase the happy hormones, if you will, like serotonin. Uh, we've seen that if you take those bacteria, those good bacteria, put them in the gut of mice, um, that they can show decreased levels of, you know, the steroids like cortisol in the blood. And if you give a fecal transplant from an anxious mouse, you can do the same thing. You can take their gut flora, put it into, you know, a normal mouse, and that mouse will start to exhibit these same signs of anxiety. You know, these tend to have uh, more of the bad or, or, or bacteria called Campylobacter that, that can, you know, increase things like anxiety and so on. So, so not only can this be able to affect weight, like mentioned in the initial twin example, but it can affect your mood, not by giving a medication that has the potential to, um, you know, limit the amount of serotonin that is retaken in or the reuptake inhibitors, but it actually will, will be able to, through the gut, through the microbes that are there, will increase production of these happy hormones like dopamine, serotonin, and we can actually help treat or affect, you know, uh, conditions like depression, anxiety, and things like that by improving our gut health. Isn't this fascinating? I think it's super fascinating. Of course, I'm, I'm going to say here as a, I'll always put in my uh, show notes that, you know, although I am a physician, I'm not your physician. And what I'm saying here is not to be construed as medical advice for you, but it's information and it's my opinion, but it's based on fact and evidence. And I uh, I just think this is fascinating that we can actually affect our mood through our gut and through how we take care of our gut and what makes up our gut, the diversity in our gut. Isn't this fascinating? Are you guys enjoying this? I hope you are. It's, I just think it's so fascinating. And it, it, I think it's, for me, it's, it kind of bums me out that I didn't know about this 20 years ago. And it wasn't really taught in my medical school. I had to learn this later on. And so, <laughs> oh, I'm just, it's just exciting. And I'm so grateful that I can share it with you. So read that article uh, or even just skim it because it's super interesting. Lots of interesting examples there. It's just fascinating to see how the gut bacteria in us can actually cause us to do certain things, you know, both on a chemical level, like modulating receptors to manufacturing, you know, hormonal messengers to affecting, you know, how we crave certain foods. I just, I just think this is fascinating. I mean, these gut bacteria can actually kind of hijack our gut nervous system or our enteric nervous system 
um, through these mechanisms and others, you know, they can affect what's called the vagus nerve, you know, which is kind of the master nerve, if, if you will. And, and <laughs> I just find this fascinating. This is actually the same nerve that, that exercise can affect and cause us, you know, to be positively impacted in our health to help us through exercise because it actually increases what's called the parasympathetic vagal tone that exercise does, which is, which is what a healthy gut can do as well. So diversity, not only in our stock portfolio or in retirement portfolio is important, but diversity is key to a healthy microbiome. It's also key to fewer bad cravings, right? And so Oh, I just, I just find this fascinating and there's so much more I want to get into, but I just, you know, I don't want to get too nitty gritty with the science at, at this point, but just, it's so fascinating. And just to summarize, our microbiome is a key part of us and it can significantly affect our overall health, whether we choose to recognize it or not. Like me 20 years ago, I didn't recognize it. I didn't know anything about it, but it was affecting my life. And so why not learn about it, have the knowledge, and then take action? Let's do something to improve our gut flora, to improve our microbiome, to take care of it so we can have this high level of diversity, which is what we want, which will help us to fight disease, which will help us avoid those opportunistic infections, like I mentioned, like C. diff, which will help us, you know, get the good balance in our gut of bacteria and avoid the bad balance or the dysbiosis, which unfortunately is so common and causes all those things we talked about, the bloating, the brain fog, the fatigue, the stomach upset, the skin conditions, eczema, yeast overgrowth, all these things. Why not take a stand and pay attention to what we put into our bodies, right? We can change this. We can affect this. This is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. We within us can decide what we're going to put into our body and what we're feeding ourselves and also concomitantly or at the same time, what is feeding our gut and these microbes, why not give it all the best stuff so that they have what they need to be diverse, to be able to help us fight, um, you know, the invaders and affect our immune system to fight these bad cravings to, you know, why not give them what they need so we can have this diversity so we can be healthier and, <laughs> You know, there's so many mechanisms, so many ways that we can do this. And, and truly, it's a whole nother podcast in and of itself. But suffice it to say, if we do our best to eat more clean, right, more whole foods, natural, and not, you know, not the processed ones, not the simple carbs, if we can actually increase, you know, our fresh foods, primarily plant-based, hopefully organic ones as well, um, if we can increase these in our diet with the fresh, whole, clean foods, fruits and vegetables, lots of vegetables with the fiber, because like I mentioned, the fiber oftentimes isn't for us, but it's actually for our gut. It's the food for the gut that produces then, they break it down, produce the short chain fatty acids, which then are the ones that help our cells. And so if we can do this through our diet and support them, these gut bacteria that we need with the appropriate pre and probiotics, which we can get both from food and from supplementing, we can feed this good bacteria of our gut to affect this positive change in our microbiome. And so isn't this awesome? I mean, it's not only a matter of life and death for the microbes that live there within us, but it can significantly affect our lives and help us to live more healthy and ultimately happier, right? Because our health is really all we've got. And the more healthy we are, it's going to be a lot easier to be happy and to live a fuller life if we feel good, right? Trust me, the converse is not fun. I see it every day in my medical practice. You know, these chronic diseases, they really take a toll on us and take a toll on our mental health. And they, you know, you don't want that. And lots of this, as mentioned, can be tied into our gut health, the health of our microbiome. Plus, not to mention, you know, all the feel-good hormones, right, that we've talked about, dopamine, serotonin, which are primarily produced in our gut. So, so let's pay attention. It's a win-win for us and a win-win, you know, for our gut microbes because through this and through improving their health, we can commonly at the same time improve our own health, our own physical health, our mental health, emotional health. And what could be more simple, right? This is just a simple intervention of how we care 
for our guts, how we care for our microbiome. It's not going away, so why not make it a true partner in our quest for optimal health? So super exciting stuff. I can't wait to discuss further in additional podcasts with more of the details of how we can do this. But just want you guys to know that truly this is a message of hope and positivity because we can affect this change. We can decide how we feed our gut. We get to do this. And so much of our health and our lives depends on it. So let's pay attention. We've got this. You guys got this. You can do this. So exciting. Super exciting. So much here. I can't wait to share more and more with you. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Keep the feedback coming too as we continue this journey together. Feel free to leave us a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to this. Please make comments too because I'm going to share with them, share with you guys on future podcasts, your comments. You can also reach out to me at Aloha Surf Doc or at Modern Medicine Movement Podcast. You can also get on our email list, thomas-hemingway.com. This will all be in the show notes. I'll be sending out free newsletters in the future to help you and us on our journey as we all strive to attain optimal health and wellness. And I'm right here with you. I'm on this journey with you and for you in our quest for optimal health. And let's do this. Let's do this together. So sending you guys a big aloha and mahalo. Until next time.